Spotify decides to make a lot of things e-waste NVIDIA. It makes more money than all of Germany, and Samsung is terrible with repair. They are taking your data. It's worse than Apple. Let's get into hot news, everybody. I'm your Brett host. We're gonna be going over the hottest tech news that I can find on the internet while you enjoy your breakfast this Friday, May 24th, 2024. We're gonna start off today with an article that definitely infuriates Kyler, which is that Spotify's car thing is not only going to lose its support December 9th of this year, they are actually advising that they're gonna stop having them work altogether. And if you've got one, this little thing that clips onto your ventilation section of your car, well, you should throw it away. That $90 that you spent when it first came out or $50 if you got it on sale right before it was discontinued, you can now expect that that will be e-waste with Spotify saying that they discontinued it due to product demand and supply chain issues and that existing devices will perform as intended when they stopped making them, but they didn't say for how long and now the date is known of when they are going to stop it from operating. They are ceasing this from actually being able to access Spotify and work the way that it's supposed to, which is just awful for a lot of people who used it. A lot of people beloved that thing, even Kyler, isn't that right? Ah! You wanna come talk about it? I'm angry. So the Spotify car thing, does that just connect to your phone? It's actually, it's really convoluted and kind of annoying. They could have done it better, but it was, once it was all set up, it was really convenient. Your phone connects to it, but your phone also connects to the radio and it's like a controller for your phone. It's not actually going through the Spotify car thing at all. Okay, so it's not like they were supporting a monthly data subscription that they have a reason to shut this down besides API access. I, it's the only thing I can think of is that they have uh, integrated voice controls that are like uh, activated by saying, hey Spotify, um, that were really convenient to have. That and uh, there's buttons on the top of the device that you can program to different playlists that was really convenient so you could set you can swap them around however you wanted. So one could be like an audiobook that you're listening to, one's your liked songs, one's an album you have in rotation. And now it's just gone. And why would somebody have this instead of just Apple CarPlay? Potentially you have a vehicle such as like and or a 2005 Subaru Baja that does not have a screen. <laughs> So it's cheaper for you to get this than to get like a whole Android Auto Apple CarPlay standalone device. Yeah, yeah, it made more sense. I don't. I only use Spotify to listen to music, and it made sense for me, especially whenever it went on sale. And I never imagined that they would just drop support for it. I knew it was discontinued, and that I'd be using like a dated product. But, but it's just about two years since they announced this thing. It's not been out for that long. It, I think it was announced in 2021 and it was a wait list to get on it. You couldn't actually buy the product until like not too long ago. And now you're not gonna be able to use it anymore. I just think it'd be cool if they opened it up and they let developers kind of tinker with it, made it open source, let people do whatever they want with it. Based on what I know about Spotify, they're not gonna do that. This is the company that laid off a bunch of employees and then we're like, I didn't realize that that would make us worse as a company. We are actually less productive with the fewer people because we laid off important individuals. So it would be cool, you're right. Maybe with enough uproar, they'll change their tune and fix things. I'm not throwing away mine. I'm keeping it. Maybe you'll be able to hack it. Maybe I'll smash it. I'm gonna cut that, get out of here. But while Spotify's discontinuing their car thing, NVIDIA is continuing with their gaming thing. With us getting in details on the RTX 5090, some new rumors coming out indicating that it's gonna have a triple PCB setup with having many different sides of memory. It's gonna have a whole lot of GDR7 in a very unique layout surrounding the entire founder's PCB. And it might be very similar to the weird board that we saw with this leaked four slot cooler that was allegedly supposed to be the 4090 Ti, where it actually sat perpendicular to how it normally does on a regular graphics card. But regardless of whether or not this rumor is substantiated, whatever the 5090 ends up being, Nvidia doesn't need you to buy it, you poor gamer. They don't need your $2,500 for the 5090 because they are just making it obscene 
amount of money with all of their data center stuff. They came out with their Q1 financial report and it is just mind boggling how much money they made. We've already talked about this every single time they've come out with their quarterly earnings. Ever since this kind of AI boom has started, it's been obscene amounts of money every single time. And this time is even higher. They're coming out with $26 billion in Q1, which ended on April 28th for them with them showing that yes, 26 billion in revenue, 78% gross margin. They're showing here that it's $6 of earnings per share, which is absolutely nutty. Their net income's up 628% year on year. Their operating income's up 690%. And it, again, it's all essentially coming from data center. 22 billion out of that 26 billion is accounted for in the data center. Companies buying the H100, H200 GPUs. Gaming is up 18% year on year, but kind of down from Q4 when the holiday shopping, but that honestly, they did more money in one quarter with data center than they would do in two and a half years with gaming. So it's showing that there's just a lot of cash flowing Nvidia's way. They do have their next generation Blackwell cards that are supposed to be coming out later this year, which they say that the demand for that is outpacing what their supply is going to be. So expect this number to potentially get higher. They're projecting revenues of 28 billion dollars for Q2. At this, the stock jumped through the moon. It was over a thousand dollars at the time of recording which put their market share higher than a whole bunch of different things they're nine times the market cap of amd the combined market cap of amazon and tesla or four times that of tesla 10 times the market cap of qualcomm the market cap of walmart and amazon combined the russia is entire gdp plus 300 billion dollars in cash the entire market cap of germany's entire stock market rolled up in one little gpu company that started at denny's and would have completely collapsed if it it worked for a $5 million investment from Sega back when they were making the Dreamcast GPU. What a wild ride it has been for NVIDIA and just, I'm kinda at least thankful they're still planning on making gaming GPUs because if they weren't, I wouldn't blame them. They're making way more money, not caring about us gamers whatsoever. They can charge us whatever they want. And if we don't pay for it, they don't need our money anyways. Additionally, they are planning a 10 to one stock split that's supposed to happen on June 7th. So it's going to be a mighty time for Nvidia. They are just propping up the entire stock market right now. And while Nvidia is just hammering away at making tons of cash, AMD finally fixed the little bug that they had in their anti-lag plus software that got you banned from multiplayer games. They are now launching anti-lag 2.0, which is the updated version of anti-lag plus which again, as mentioned, got people banned from games like Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, PUBG, Apex Legends, Counter-Strike 2, because it just did not work with anti-cheats. But now there's a technical preview available in Counter-Strike 2 that you can turn on that will allow you to get the reduced latency in video games. Also, it's been updated so that it now supports GPUs down to the RX 5000 series, whereas at launch, Anti-Lag Plus was only for the RX 7000 series. It's not clear when this is gonna roll out to other games, but you can check out the technical preview for Counter-Strike 2 in case you're interested in that. And there's also a technical preview of new RAM that's gonna be shown off at Computex. MSI in Kingston announcing DDR5 Cam 2 RAM on the Project Zero Z790 motherboard. You can see it right there. It's flattened RAM just being smushed onto a desktop motherboard. And in case you're not familiar with LP Cam 2, it's actually started to make its way into laptops as of late. And that's been the big benefit that you get. It actually comes in a very tiny form factor is dual channel by itself so you don't need to have multiple sticks and allows you to have a smaller form factor while getting the same speed up to 64 percent smaller than ddr5 sodium because instead of having two little ram sticks you have one little replaceable ram module so while it's been a great asset for laptops and is going to continue to roll out in various different laptops as the years go by it's not quite clear why this is being implemented on a desktop motherboard that you don't need to save size space. The cooler that you're gonna put on that CPU is gonna be way taller than the RAM is. It does potentially get rid of RAM compatibility coolers so that you could just have it stretch out the entire side of your motherboard, which could allow for new cooler designs. It could be pretty neat that way. But this appears to be more of a technical showcase than anything. And obviously you have to ask the question, where does the RGB go? I have no idea where you put lights on that thing. But while RAM's getting smaller, it turns out that Apple wants to make their MacBooks bigger with reports coming out that they're gonna have a foldable MacBook 
Pro, potentially MacBook Air type device that should be launching sometime in 2026 with the M5 or M6 chip. And when it's fully unfolded, can get to the size of 20 or 18.8 inches. And then when it's all completely collapsed, it's thinner than the current MacBook Air 13 inch. Apple's allegedly working with LG to produce this display and make it as crease free as possible, which potentially could be easier than it would be on a folding phone because the typical work case for a laptop is having its clam shut a few less times than a phone that constantly goes back and forth from the pocket. But this is just preliminary indications from Apple trying to source a few different parts. It could be that they never end up coming out with this just like it was with the Apple car. They invested a lot of money, spent over a decade working on it, and then canned the entire project. So who knows if it actually makes it to market. And if it does, it'd probably be very difficult to repair knowing Apple. But it turns out that Samsung is gonna take the crown for the worst company to work with when it comes to repair products. Because iFixit announced yesterday that they are canceling their partnership with Samsung, specifically saying that their approach of repairability does not align with iFixit's mission and that they doubt Samsung's commitment to making repair more accessible. With them saying things like they couldn't get parts to local repair shops at prices and quantities that made business sense. The part prices were so costly that many consumers opted to replace their device rather than repair them. Additionally, they frustratingly glued their parts together, forcing them to sell batteries and screens in pre-glued bundles that increased the cost. So that's pretty damning that iFixit is removing themselves from that partnership, but it turns out they weren't making a whole lot of money or selling a lot of parts in the first place because of Samsung's negative commitment to the entire venture. Additionally, Samsung wasn't providing all of that many parts to iFixit, with the S22 lineup being the last official generation that iFixit got official parts for from Samsung themselves. But while the iFixit story broke, there was another report that came out from 404 Media condemning Samsung even harder, with them forcing independent repair shops to submit user data up to Samsung and report whether or not third-party replacements had been used in their devices and potentially to even have those repair shops destroy users' phones. 404 Media got access to a contract showing the stipulations between this independent repair shop and Samsung, and it includes phrases like the company shall immediately disassemble all products that are created or assembled out of comprised of or that contain any service parts not purchased from Samsung and shall immediately notify Samsung in writing of the details and circumstances of any unauthorized use or misappropriation of any service part for any purpose other than pursuant to this agreement. And it also required these repair shops to upload daily details of various different information about the customers that had their devices serviced, including their address, their email, their phone number, what's wrong with the phone, warranty status, details of the customer complaint, and the IMEI number. And one of the biggest issues that's being brought forth with this is that likely independent repair shops are not disclosing this to the customer and they're not aware that their data is actually getting provisioned to Samsung. But 404 Media talked to some consumer rights advocates and consumer rights groups trying to find out why would Samsung have all of these details in the contract and it turns out that while Samsung could say it's just about fighting counterfeits, it also is kind of in violation of the Magnuson Moss Warranty Act that allows users to have third-party repair items. They're allowed to fix their device however they want. And then if they bring their device that they fixed in certain capacities to a, an actual Samsung verified repair shop, that could potentially result in their phone being destroyed and then that user's data getting submitted to Samsung. With it looking like it's an invasion of customer privacy, it's a lot of control that Samsung's putting on these independent repair shops that actually make it so that they're Samsung Samsung repair shops. And according to all estimations, this is worse than anything Apple has done. While Apple has had their own issues with right to repair, they have done things that are not necessarily for the consumer. They have not gone as far as to require all of this user data being uploaded to them on a daily basis and then having phones destroyed if they're using third party parts. This is an egregious violation in multiple different facets. It's no wonder that iFixit has broken up in their relationship with them. With iFixit saying that they do not require this information for any other partnerships and do not share customer information with any other OEM. And when you do buy those parts over on iFixit, it does show you that you have to consent that your data is gonna be shared. So at least I fix it, making sure that the customer knew what was going on. But again, many independent repair shops likely would not do that and still have that information submitted to Samsung. It's a big problem overall. Samsung getting lambasted for their poor repair strategies. Let me know what you think about this. Have you gotten your own Samsung device repaired at an independent 
the third party repair shop and were you informed of any sort of disclosure that would happen if you got an official Samsung replacement part? Let me know down below in the comments while I respond to your comments from yesterday's episode of Hot News. We got a Rouse lamp saying DDR6 with APUs go brr. It likely will be fast, but it also uh, brings up the comparison that things like the massive APUs that you have in a PlayStation 5 or an Xbox are using GDDR RAM for a very valid reason, and that's the speed is still way higher. With the GDDR6 RAM that's in a PS5, you're looking at roughly half a terabyte per second of memory bandwidth, whereas with DDR6 21,000, you're looking at close to 170 gigabytes per second, so it's actually only still one third of the speed, and so APUs will go faster, but it still won't necessarily be as good as if they were using VRAM in the first place. And then Dustin Short talking about the ScarJo situation with OpenAI saying, I said this on the last one too, Bette Midler versus Ford Motor Company in 1984. They wanted her to sing a song. She said no. They hired an impersonator. She sued and won in a federal appeals court, setting a pretty strong precedent. OpenAI asked Scarlett to do the voice and she said no. They claimed they talked to the other voice after before asking Johansson, but I suspect once they asked Scarlett, she even the her tweet sunk any defense that it's coincidental, which is why they pulled the voice so quick. That does appear to be the case, and I think that's one of the things where I've heard a lot of arguments of being like, well, she can't own her voice if other people use it, and that's actually, with the Bette Midler case, this is something that I neglected to mention, like, there, there is this aspect of celebrities do get to have ownership of their likeness. It's different than the common person. One of their industry, part of the industry trade of being a celebrity is that your name, your image, and your likeness are the things that carry value. And so when a company chooses to hire an impersonator, it can be a violation, especially if they denied consent in the first place. This is something that even happens in the voice acting community. I remember James Arnold Taylor, who's the voice behind Obi-Wan in the Clone Wars, voice Tidus in Final Fantasy X. <laughs> He had a vlog about his voice acting experience and one of the contracts he was hired on for was to do an impersonation of a different character. And he refused to do that and almost lost the job. And he had to communicate to the people that hired him, hey, I can't actually reproduce this other person's voice without their consent. I know that I have the range to do it, but I don't have the permission to do it, regardless of whether or not you want me to do the voice. That ended up getting resolved because they did get the consent from the other voice actor that James Arnold Taylor could represent replicate his voice. So even if somebody sounds like Scarlett Johansson and they use that to train their data, even if it's not perfect, but the intent was to have it sound like Scarlett Johansson and get you to think about her, the movie, and her, the person, well, then that creates enough of a connection that there could potentially be some legal ground that OpenAI is very shaky on. And then Nicholas saying, can you see a future where you just dock your phone and boom, PC, maybe dock has a GPU on it and then you fit a gaming PC? My friend, the future, that's been in the past. Samsung's done that. I, I think Motorola had one. There's been so many different iterations where you can put your phone into a dock and it tries to turn it into a computer. Hopefully that changes obviously with Windows supporting ARM a bit more effectively. Maybe that could happen. I'm interested to see if that, that moves forward. And I'm also interested in being done in this episode of Hot News. We'll be back with more of the hottest tech news on Monday. And then we got to go to Computex. We're heading to Taiwan to cover that. So uh, next week's going to be a little bit of a variable week, but we'll see you for some of it.